Good afternoon. Today, the committee will consider the nomination of Brian Todd Newland of Michigan to be Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. President Biden nominated Mr. Newland for this position on April 27th of this year. This hearing is a, an important first step in carrying out the Senate's constitutional duty to provide advice and consent. It's an opportunity to learn how, if confirmed, Mr. Newland plans to carry out and uphold the United States' trust responsibilities to American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and to, na to the Native Hawaiian community and about his priorities and goals for his leadership in the Indian Affairs hallway. It is quite simply one of the most consequential nominations for Native communities across our nation. Because as the department's highest ranking Senate confirmed official in Indian Affairs, the Assistant Secretary is charged with maintaining the government to government relationships with sovereign tribal nations, respecting tribal sovereignty and promoting tribal self-determination. All are key to supporting the Secretary and meeting the department's mission. I believe that Mr. Newland has the qualifications, the character, and the heart to succeed in the role of Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Indeed, Mr. Newland, a tribal citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community and, for, and the first graduate of the Indian Law Program at Michigan State University College of Law, is uniquely qualified. Prior to his current role as the department's principal deputy assistant secretary for Indian Affairs, Mr. Newland served his tribe with distinction for several years, serving as its duly elected president, the chief judge of its tribal court, chairman of the tribe's gaming authority and business holdings board of directors, and as a member of the board of regents for the tribally controlled Bay Mills Community College. Mr. Newland's previous federal experience in the executive branch as a presidentially appointed counselor and policy advisor to the assistant secretary for Indian Affairs under the Obama administration and his command of federal Indian law and policy strengthens his nomination. I believe Mr. Newland has the necessary experience to hit the ground running, implement the president's agenda, and execute Indian country's priorities. His sincerity and willingness to learn are key attributes to this position, and Mr. Newland has made clear that he's committed to serving as the chief federal advocate for not just tribal nations, but for Native Hawaiians as well. That's not just my assessment. Uh, more than 30 tribes and tribal organizations, including the United South and Eastern Tribes, the National Congress of American Indians, and the Alaska Federation of Natives, submitted letters in support of Mr. Newland's confirmation. I have made them all part of the record. Before I turn to the Vice Chair, I would like to thank Mr. Newland and his family uh, for joining us today, and what a pleasure it was uh, to meet all of you. I look forward to considering this important nomination and to working with Vice Chair Murkowski and all of the members of this committee to move Mr. Newland's nomination through our committee. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Newland, welcome to the committee. It's nice to be able to welcome your family as well. So we appreciate that. And I appreciate the conversation that we had uh, by phone and the opportunity to continue our discussions today. Um, I, I do just want to note for the record, it's my understanding that we're still waiting for some outstanding documents um, from your questionnaire. I understand that uh, we've been, our, our staffs have been in, in contact with you, and so I'm assuming that we will, we will get those uh, quickly and, and um, uh, just know that that's an, an important part of what we're doing here uh, this morning. Uh, as I mentioned, Mr. Newland, in our phone conversation, uh, you will be replacing Tara Sweeney, who was the first Alaska Native to hold the job of Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. Um, Ms. Sweeney is, is not only a, a woman that I've known for a long period of time, uh, what she was able to do uh, in that role is, is, a, is a considerable one and one that I'm hoping that we will continue on uh, with the good work that she laid down, most notably the, uh, the focus on on the crisis of missing, murdered Indigenous women and children. Uh, with her uh, support there as, as Assistant Secretary, we had Operation Lady Justice um, and some, some key MMIW initiatives that Senator Cortez Mesto and I have worked on uh, that have been launched in these last couple years. And so we're certainly hoping that these things that she had laid forward will be initiatives that you will continue to build on. I think there's, there's big shoes to be filled at the at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, uh, and important ones. As the chairman has noted, uh, the Office of Indian Affairs 
is, is an exceptionally important one at the Interior Department um, for all of the reasons uh, as a central rallying point for Indian initiatives across the federal government. It's called upon to educate all stakeholders, government officials, about the challenges, the problems, the opportunities that American Indians and Alaska Natives face in our country and provides solutions in a way that affirms Native self-determination. As Assistant Secretary, you'll touch the lives of most tribes through trust management of lands, Indian education, energy development, housing, public safety, economic development, such as gaming, transportation, federal acknowledgement, and, and so much. Uh, as we've discussed, the job is not an easy one. There are over 500 federally recognized tribes to serve. More than 200 of those are in my state and all have different histories, different cultures. Uh, you clearly can't take a one-size-fits-all and try to superimpose that over Indian country. There are treaties and unique laws to navigate, not to mention the ongoing debates about education, economic empowerment, land and trust, gaming, tribal jurisdiction, and the like. It is the position responsible for assisting the Secretary of the Interior in fulfilling the United States' sacred trust responsibility. When it comes to Alaska, we had talked about two of the unique laws, uh, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, ANCSA, and the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, or ANILCA. Fifty years ago, ANCSA was enacted into law as a new and a different approach by the federal government in settling Aboriginal land claims. It created native corporations, referred to as ANCs, throughout the state, a very distinct approach to land and economic development from the reservation system of the lower 48. But ANCs, as we shared, are not like traditional for-profit corporations. Instead, they're mandated by Congress to care for social, cultural, and economic well-being of their Alaska native shareholders in perpetuity. And it is through the federally recognized tribes, the tribal consortia, and ANCs that Alaska Natives deliver self-determination and self-governance programs at scale. This year, or excuse me, this includes providing services and programs to address the pandemic that we saw this throughout this past year. But even though Congress set up different types of structures for Native peoples across the country, whether tribes are located in PL 280 states or if they have different land claim settlements, it is important to understand and to represent all of them. Um, in our phone conversation, we, we discussed ANCSA and these relationships. Uh, I'm raising it here again because uh, some of what you shared with me at the time um, with regards to distribution of funds from the CARES Act tribal set aside in the, in the coronavirus relief fund showed me that, that you are still educating yourself about Alaska Native institutions, so I'm hoping to hear more today uh, from you on that and, and, and really just reaffirming your support to be a strong advocate for all Native peoples. I think we've got a lot of work, a lot of work that we need to do. Uh, I want to highlight just a few of those in Alaska. Um, I've shared with you the concern that I have had now for decades about the good people of, of King Cove, the Aleut people, who have been seeking a life-saving road for, for over three decades from the federal government. Um, also, what more needs to be done to speed up the cleanup of federal contamination on native conveyed lands. There's more than a thousand sites that the federal government is legally responsible for. Um, I know that this is not an, just an issue for us in Alaska, but it's faced by so many Native communities across the country. And these are, these are really environmental justice issues. It's also time for the federal government to allow tribes to dictate how they want to utilize energy development on their lands, whether it's renewables or resource extraction. It should be the tribes that, that decide, um, not the department. I would be remiss if I didn't mention public safety and particularly the need to strengthen the tribal provisions in VAWA. So, Mr. Newland, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about your vision for the Office of Indian Affairs um, and, and that with the questions uh, from myself and members, we'll learn a little bit more and uh, may have additional questions uh, following that. So again, thank you, congratulations. Ms. Mr. Chair, I turn it back to you and look forward to Mr. Newland's uh, comments this morning, afternoon. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Murkowski. I'll now turn to uh, Senator Gary Peters. Uh, also of Michigan to introduce uh, his, his his constituent and our nominee. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and uh, Madam uh, Vice Chair Markowski and distinguished uh, members of the committee. 
It's uh, my honor uh, to introduce Brian Todd Newland as President Biden's nominee to be the next Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Indian Affairs. I am confident uh, that if confirmed, Mr. Newland will be well positioned to assist and support Secret Secretary Holland uh, in fulfilling the United States trust responsibility and maintaining the federal tribal government to government relationship. Mr. Newland's prior experience at the Department of the Interior and his unique perspective as a former tribal leader provides him with deep understanding of the many issues facing tribal governments. And his voice will be critical in supporting the tribes in Michigan, as well as all across uh, the country. Mr. Newland is a citizen of the Bay Mills Indian community in Michigan, a former president of its executive council, and former chief judge of Bay Mills Tribal Court. During his time serving the Bay Mills Indian community, Mr. Newland played an instrumental role in a number of economic ventures, infrastructure projects, and the successful administration of dozens of tribal departments, employees, and programs. During his tenure as tribal president, his administration also secured funding for the construction of a $15 million healthcare facility that will serve the entire Eastern Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Mr. Newland's tenure also occurred during one of the hardest years for the Bay Mills Indian community that they have endured uh, both economically, financially, and emotionally due to the COVID-19 pandemic. His steady leadership was critical in ensuring that the Bay Mills Indian community could weather the storm and emerge from the pandemic in a stable position. Further, his nomination enjoys the support of the 35 tribal nations from the Midwest Alliance of Sovereign Tribes, as well as from tribal nations all across the United States. From 2009 to 2012, Mr. Newland served as the counselor and policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Indian Affairs. In that capacity, he helped develop the Obama administration's policies on Indian gaming and Indian lands, reforming the Department of the Interior's policy on reviewing tribal state gaming compacts. He also led a team that improved the Bureau of Indian Affairs leasing regulations and worked to help enact the Hearth Act of 2012, which allows tribes to lease restricted lands for residential, business, public, educational, or recreational purposes without the approval of the Secretary of the Interior. Prior to his federal service, Mr. Newland worked as an attorney with the Fletcher Law Firm in Lansing, Michigan. He represented tribal clients on issues including the regulation of gaming facilities, negotiation of tribal state gaming compacts, the fee for trust process, and leasing of Indian lands. He graduated magna cum laude from Michigan State University College of Law and received his undergraduate degree from James Madison College of Michigan State University. Go green. Mr. Newland enjoys uh, hiking and kayaking the shores of Lake Superior and is a nature photography enthusiast. He is joined here today by his wife, Erica, his daughter, Meredith, his son, Grady, and his parents, Vicki and Gordon Newland. Mr. Newland has been an incredible partner to my office and to my staff and to many all across the, the great state of Michigan over many, many years. And I know he'll be an excellent partner to all of us upon his confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, for the opportunity to appear today to introduce Brian and uh, thank Brian for his willingness uh, to serve the public in this capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Peters. I think on behalf of uh, my father, I'm obligated to say go blue. Uh, 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 I will now swear in the nominee. Uh, Mr. Newland, please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you shall give today shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? Thank you. Please be seated. I want to remind you that your full written testimony will be made part of the official hearing record. Uh, please keep your statement to no more than five minutes so that members have time for questions. Uh, Mr. Newland, please begin. Ani, miigwech. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee 
First, I want to thank uh, Senator Peters for his warm and kind introduction and his leadership in, um, for the state of Michigan and his friendship as well. Um, it's an honor to be here today as President Biden's nominee to serve as Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior, an important position uh, that serves as a leader for the U.S. trust relationship with tribal nations. It's also a privilege to serve with Secretary Holland at such an important time for Indian country. I'm so happy to have my wife Erica here with me. Uh, we grew up together on the Bay Mills Reservation and she's been my partner, strategic advisor, and most importantly, my designated humbler every step of the way. Together we have two incredible children, Graydon and Meredith, who are also here, as are my parents, Gordon and Vicki Newland. My parents had me at a young age under difficult circumstances and worked hard to raise my brother Robert, my sister Holly, and me. They also had long careers in public service and instilled those values in us, and I want to thank them for that. Growing up on our reservation, I saw how federal laws and policies affected the lives of everyday Indians. Commercial tribal fishers exercised treaty-protected fishing rights to feed their families. I lived up the street from the Bay Mills Community College, which was the first tribally controlled community college established in the state of Michigan. Our family also lived in tribal housing, which is supported by federal funding. My parents were fortunate to each have jobs, which allowed them to get a land lease so that we could move out of tribal housing and purchase a home. We lived in a single wide trailer for several years while they waited for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to approve their mortgage. When that mortgage was finally approved, my parents became the first people on our reservation to have a mortgage financed home. Their experience with the BIA's time-consuming mortgage approval process and the delays they faced was an experience that would stick with me. I attended Michigan State University and the MSU College of Law where I was the first Native student to enroll in the Indigenous Law and Policy Program. I graduated there in 2007 and started in private practice. But soon after, I had the opportunity to serve in President Obama's administration at the Department of the Interior within the office of the Assistant Secretary. There, I was lucky to have mentors like Larry Echohawk and Del Lavender. We worked to reform leasing on Indian lands so, uh, by putting timelines in place so that other families wouldn't face the same delays and circumstances my parents did. We worked with members of this committee to uh, see the bipartisan enactment of the Hearth Act, putting tribes back in control of leasing and home mortgages on tribal lands. After that, I returned home and used my experience to serve my own tribe, to teach Indian law to aspiring native attorneys, and to advocate on behalf of other tribes. In 2013, I was elected as chief judge of the Bay Mills Tribal Court. In that role, I heard heart-wrenching cases about families in crisis, and I also enforced criminal laws in a deliberate and fair way. In that position, we worked to establish the Bay Mills Healing to Wellness Court. It's a substance abuse treatment court that has helped reunite families, provide job opportunities and housing to people in need, and to maintain our tribal connections to one another. In 2017, our tribe elected me to serve as tribal president, and we set about to make Bay Mills a better place to live. We were making progress when the pandemic struck, and that became an important life or death focus of mine. Through our partnership with the Indian Health Service, we established community surveillance testing for COVID-19. We saw a disproportionately low rate of infection on our reservation, thanks to nonpartisan coordination with local, state, and federal officials. At the same time, we were able to expand our tribal businesses, develop a new health center, and grow jobs and incomes at Bay Mills, which were important goals for our community. I know firsthand the experience or the connection between public service and the lives of others. When you live with the people you serve, you can't escape that connection. If you make a mistake, you see it. And if you don't see it, there's sure to be an auntie or a friend there to remind you. If, co if confirmed, I will bring that perspective with me to the Department of the Interior. We must help Indian country build back better after the pandemic. We must respond with urgency to the violence against indigenous women and children across Indian country. And we must lay the foundation for the next generation of native children to succeed. I believe that tribal governments, rather than federal agencies, are best suited to respond to the challenges their communities face. Our job is to be a collaborative trustee and ensure that Indian country drives our work. 
With your consent, I'll be a leader on those important efforts. I want to say miigwech again, thank you, for the opportunity to be here today and for your service to our country. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Newland. You were an elected tribal leader, and I think the first question I have for you is, if confirmed, what lessons from that experience will you, will you take into the role as Assistant Secretary, and what specific improvements do you think need to be made for, that, that you're gonna bring your old perspective into your new role? Thank you for that question, Chairman Schatz. Um, I think the, the most important lesson I learned serving as tribal leader, again, referencing um, you know, my, my introductory comments, is that um, I, under, I understand that when we show up to work every day and do something or don't do something, that it affects the lives of people. And so um, I want to make sure that as, as I go to work, if I have the privilege of being confirmed, that I keep that in mind. Um, and that uh, another thing I learned working with uh, other elected members of our tribal council in a community that governs itself through a general tribal council is that consensus building is important. And um, while we have many urgent issues to tackle, um, we also must work to make sure that uh, we are meaningfully engaged with tribes across Indian country and stakeholders um, so that the decisions that we make and the policies we enact that make sure that they stick. Um, because when you don't have consensus, when you don't take the time to build that, oftentimes the change you seek it, it eludes you because people haven't bought in. So those are some of the lessons that I would bring with me to the department. A friend of mine in Hawaii says you got to go slow to go fast. Um, so I, I agree with, with, with your perspective on consensus building. Um, BIE in particular has been really awful in responding to committee requests. Uh, letters, uh, questions for the record, they're just late. Sometimes they never get back to us. Um, do I have your commitment that if confirmed um, that um, you will make sure the BIE and BIA and other bureaus over which you have responsibility timely respond to any committee member who has uh, 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 any formal correspondence? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have my commitment. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to you just a little bit about the OIG. I, the paperwork you submitted uh, indicates that you agree, but for the, for the hearing record, um, uh, if confirmed, will you ensure that the OIG has the ability to perform its duties without interference? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, the Office of Inspector General has a, a, a very important role to play um, and I respect that role and will work to make sure that they have the ability to do their job without any interference. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Native Hawaiian Trust responsibility, the federal trust responsibility uh, encompassing American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. Um, I think, you know, there, there tends to be a misunderstanding depend on where, depending on where you reside within the executive branch. Um, I was just talking to Secretary Becerra about this, that even though the, the um, trust responsibility as it relates to Native Hawaiians is sometimes expressed either through funding or statutory law in a different part of the federal architecture, both bureaucratically and in terms of the law itself, that doesn't make it any less valid. Um, and, and I'm just wanting your commitment to not just recognize it as a, as a person and as a leader in a specific position, but as an advocate across the federal government, everybody has to understand that just because, for instance, Native Hawaiian education, Native Hawaiian health, Native Hawaiian housing may reside in a different place, right, and may be administered by a different mm -hmm. department or agency, doesn't make it any less valid. And I really need your commitment to sort of be the watcher here, um, whether it's HHS uh, or uh, United States Department of Education uh, or the Department of Interior, do I have your commitment to kind of articulate across agencies that 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 the government, the government's um, obligation um, um, it, it sticks, whether it's Native Hawaiians, uh, Alaska Natives, or American Indians? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, for your comments and your advocacy on behalf of Native Hawaiians, and you have my commitment to work with you and other officials across the federal government to make sure that we're carrying out our legal and our moral obligations to Native Hawaiian people. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Murkowski. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Newland, as I mentioned in our call and, and just in my opening here, um, just the differences that we have in Alaska when it comes to Alaska Native governance and representation um, and, and the distinction with our ANCs that were created, created through uh, ANCSA. So we, we learned very clearly, I think, um, after the passage of the CARES Act and the Treasury's actions to disperse uh, the funds under the tribal set-aside, it became clear to us in Alaska that uh, the structure when it comes to, to uh, Alaska Native governance is, is just not as well understood as we believe it is. It's been around now for 40 years, and we think that others understand it. But because it is so unique to Alaska, I think it is, it is an ongoing education issue. We saw that play out. We're now awaiting the decision by the Supreme Court in the Chehalis uh, litigation. But uh, I just need to know that you are aware of how important it is that ANCs are included in the ISDIA definition of, of Indian tribe which is referenced in, in hundreds of other statutes. Oh, I'm also <clears throat> needing to, to reinforce and make sure that you are aware of how important it is that ANCs serve as the recognized governing body of an Indian tribe under ISDIA and, and DOI guidelines, sometimes only in limited circumstances. But I know that you have been, um, been looking further into this in and in, uh, in not only preparation for this hearing, uh, but just in the, the role that you have been nominated to. So again, if you can just affirm to me that you do understand the importance of, of what I have just laid down, and if you can share with me uh, what you are doing to, to uh, educate yourself now on, on ANCSA and ANILCA and Alaska's unique structure uh, that serves tribal communities. And, and, and making sure that not only for yourself, uh, but for others in your office, that you will uh, commit to the ANCSA and the, NIL the ANILCA trainings uh, that are, are provided if you are confirmed. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. I, I appreciate your comments. And it, first, I would share your assessment that um, there's a lot of educating that needs to be done on the unique uh, structure of Indian law in Alaska. And uh, I will acknowledge that I am working to educate myself on those laws as well. And, and I have been working diligently since I arrived at the department to uh, work with the experts within the department uh, to understand ANCSA and ANILCA and, um, and also the other uh, unique ways that other laws interact with those statutes. Um, and I am also looking forward to having the opportunity to getting on the ground into your state uh, and working with leaders and visiting communities and understanding and, and hearing directly from them. Uh, I believe there is no substitute for that. Um, so, the, which is all a, a long-winded preface, I know, to uh, respond to your question, uh, which is that I am committed to better understanding uh, and to carrying out my responsibility uh, to the 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, as well as the corporations there, and um, am eager to work with you and your team and uh, folks across Alaska. Well, I, I thank you for that. I think, I think you have been made aware that, that uh, uh, because of some of the comments that were made last year, comments that were very critical uh, of ANCs in the context of the CARES implementation, in, including comments that you have made, that the, the temperature on this uh, got pretty hot there for a while. So I think it's going to be important um, to not only lower that temperature, but for you um, uh, in this position, to, to really set that tone um, as an ambassador and as an advocate for all of Indian country and, and Native people. Um, very quickly, because my time is just about expired here, but uh, Alaska is uh, a PL 280 state. Um, we, have, we have been working over the years to, to piece together different grants and, and programs to support our public safety. Uh, systems, 
and we have been able to uh, direct PL2, uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, funding to Alaska for our tribal courts, even though we are a PL280 state. So your, your position um, on using BIA funding for tribal courts in PL280 states like Alaska, recognizing your significant experience with the tribal court system. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, consistent with what you've just laid out under the President's uh, rescue plan um, that Congress enacted, we, uh, we work toward that end uh, with um, leaders across Alaska Native uh, communities to make sure that even uh, that our law enforcement funding that came down through the Department of the Interior uh, acknowledged the unique challenges that um, tribes in public law 280 states faced uh, so that uh, we made sure that they were not excluded from public safety funding under the rescue plan. And um, I, I think that's important as you've laid out and I look forward to working on it if confirmed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Newland, congratulations on thank your you. nomination. Welcome to your family. And, and thank you for taking the time with me to talk with me prior to today's hearing uh, as we talked about important issues at impact tribal communities in my state and across the country. One of the things I wanna focus on is the need for um, better coordination among the federal agencies as it comes to representing and providing additional and necessary resources to our tribal communities. Um, one, I wanna get a commitment from you um, that you're willing to not only appear before us but work with other federal agencies on issues, whether it is economic development or infrastructure that pertain to tribal communities. Are you willing to do that? Uh, yes, Senator. And then two, there, there are two issues really um, on a, a priority for me, and one of them, and I'm gonna need your help with this, um, has to do with wildfires. Many, uh, you, you know, in the West, we are seeing more and more wildfires. We are dealing with this uh, here in Congress, not only the resources, but addressing the prevention, suppression, all of the above. I wanna make sure our tribal communities are brought into this conversation because they are dealing with the wildfires and, and it, it necessary resources to assist them. Um, but it requires you to work with other federal agencies to really come to the table and have a coordinated response uh, for policies, protocols, working with state and local and uh, as well as our tribal communities, most importantly. So can you talk a little bit about that, what is already being done, and wh what you can promise that at least or make a commitment that we can address for the future? Sure. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about this a, a little bit. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the great things I think this administration has already done on this effort is to reconstitute the White House Council on Native American Affairs because the trust obligation to Indian country does not rest solely within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's the United States trust obligation. And that allows us to actually put action behind the all of government approach to issues across Indian country, including uh, wildfire issues. And I know that Secretary Holland and Secretary Vilsack at uh, Department of Agriculture have um, been speaking and working uh, on wildfire issues across the West, and particularly as they relate to Indian country and, and protecting uh, tribes and making sure tribes have resources on that. And within the department, we have uh, bureaus uh, coordinating um, in anticipation of this year's wildfire season. Um, but you know, the White House Council is going to be critical to making sure that this coordination on Indian country issues happens. And um, I'm really glad to be a part of it. And, and thank you. And really what I'm looking for is um, action items coming from that whether they're MOUs or agreements, um, policies, protocols, and how the agencies, who's gonna take the lead uh, at certain times, but how it actually gets done at, at the end of the day. So I'm hopeful that you'll help me uh, make sure that that happens. Um, let, let me jump to another issue. Um, when it comes to a tribal energy loan guarantee program, um, we've discussed this previously, but let me just uh, broach this again with you. Um, Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program has not issued any loans since it was authorized under the Energy Policy Act of 2005. I think this is a missed opportunity to help tribes as they look to deploy 
renewable energy. Um, in the fiscal year 2021 consolidated appropriations bill included language to encourage the Department of Energy's Office of Indian Energy to better market the program. So if confirmed, will you commit uh, to reviewing the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program and expediting efforts to make the program more accessible to tribes? Sure. Thank you, Senator. This goes back to the all-of-government approach you've, you've referenced in, in your first question. And we have been working with the Department of Energy on this and, and also trying to make sure that the uh, Department of the Interior's Indian Loan Guarantee Program uh, works with Department of Energy's loan guarantee program uh, for Indian country so that tribes have access to the capital they need to develop the resources they have um, on their lands, be they renewable energy resources or others. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your comments today. Congratulations again. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, Chair. Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Newlands, tough job to be able to step up into. You know it well because you watched it uh, when you served in the interior before. So thanks for stepping up and uh, be able to be um, energetic, I would say, to be able to step into this and be able to try it again to be able to lead it. Uh, I have multiple questions for you. Uh, I'm going to try to run through as quick as I can through several of them. This issue of tribal energy production uh, that Senator Cortez Mastu was also talking about is an important one because there are a lot of tribes in my state as well that want to continue energy production. Are you still committed to all the above energy production on native lands? Thank you, Senator. I've had an opportunity to work in your state with a number of the tribes and know how important oil and gas development is to tribes in Oklahoma. Um, my priority, if confirmed to this job, is to make sure that tribes are in control of whether, when, and how to develop their energy resources, be they renewable energy or other resources they have on, on their lands. That's great. There are a couple challenges. Let me just give you a specific. I can go through a bunch of them, but let me just zero in on one tribe in particular for the Osage. Starting in 2014, uh, the solicitor at Department of Interior determined that if they're going to get their own records to be able to do land development, energy development uh, on the Osage Nation area, then they would have to go through a FOIA request to do that. Um, for, as you know, for energy development right now with a $68, $70 a barrel, there are a lot of folks that want to do production. They're going to go to start doing production now. If they have to do a FOIA request and it takes months to years just to get the records for that area, they're not going to do it. They're going to move on. This has been a challenge for a very long time of how long it takes to be able to get to those records. Uh, I can give you multiple other examples of things that just take an extraordinarily long period of time uh, to be able to get access to information. How do we solve those things? Thank you, Senator. I don't know the, the details of that particular opinion. Right. Um, you know, but as I referenced in my introductory comments, you know, my parents faced this right. uh, when I was a kid, and, and we've lived it. And that was something that really um, stuck with me, wanted, making me want to work uh, with members of the Committee on the Hearth Act. Um, when it comes to uh, things like, like you've just referenced, um, it, it's going to be important for us to be a collaborative trustee. And, and that's going to mean that tribes are in the driver's seat for uh, what they want to do within their communities, um, it, especially in terms of economic development and energy development. And, and I don't want to be an impediment uh, for tribes. And part of that is going to involve communicating with, uh, directly with leaders of communities, kind of that, that you know, on the ground, that, that slog that uh, you, you come in day after day and, right. and build those relationships. But I also want to make sure that we're holding our staff within Indian Affairs accountable for getting the job done. That's right. important. And, that, and that's the challenge, is that there's communication there. But when it comes time to actually make the decision, the decision doesn't seem to be made, or it takes so long to get to a decision on something that would be pretty straightforward uh, that it makes it a real challenge to be able to do energy production, whether it be renewable or traditional energies. Uh, so it's, it's an area that we do need to be able to fix. Um, let me set another legal opinion. You've done so much work on Indian law. Let me bring up an obvious one uh, that's recent. It's the McGirt case. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what, everyone that I know that's dealing with Indian law right now is all interested in that case. Tell me your opinion on that. How far does that expand? What's the meaning of the McGirt case? How far does it extend beyond Oklahoma and the five tribes directly affected? Uh, thank you, Senator. That, uh, you know, the Supreme Court's decision in McGirt was... Uh, an interpretation of a single treaty for a single tribe on, on the matter of criminal prosecutions. But when you confirm the existence of reservation boundaries 
you know, that, that leads to a host of other questions, and I know that's been a particular concern for tribes and communities in Oklahoma. Um, I think it's going to be important that we take those questions as they come in terms of the consequences of the McGirt decision, because reservation boundary uh, questions, uh, questions of jurisdiction, they're so fact-specific. Even within the same reservation, they depend on the actors and the land tenure involved. And so um, it, that's all to say. I, I, I don't want to misspeak by pronouncing consequences for McGirt that, um, that don't exist yet or that haven't come before us. And I'd rather take it as it comes, work with the solicitor of the Department of the Interior, uh, affected tribes and communities, and, and try to find answers on questions as they come. Right. It, it'll be an area that we need to be able to talk about because obviously, as you mentioned, the McGirt case was a criminal case. Um, but then there have been some decisions by the Department of Interior and dealing with the Office of Service Mines and others to say, well, we've expanded it beyond criminal, uh, that we're still trying to determine where that decision got made, <clears throat> how that decision got made. And uh, so it becomes important as the state and as our tribes continue to be able to work out all the issues that will obviously be federalized as well as we actually talk through final decisions on it and what that really looks like. Uh, I'll try to submit some things for the record. Uh, I need some clarification on Indian Child Welfare. Uh, this is a significant issue for many of our tribes and individuals in the state. And then I've been pretty outspoken on off-reservation gaming uh, to say uh, that, that I completely understand all the issues with on-reservation gaming, but off-reservation gaming has its own unique challenges uh, for the governments and the counties and the cities that are now competing with a new government in the area they weren't used to, or to be able to move to another reservation and to be able to allow gaming in that area. So I'll submit those for the record for you as well. Thank you, Senator. But, Senator Lujan. Thank you, Chair Schatz, and thank you to Vice Chair Murkowski as well for holding this hearing on the nomination of Brian Newland to be the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs. And congratulations to you, sir, and to your family, and it's great to see them here with you. I want to begin by sharing the story of Helene Archuleta, who is the daughter of Betty MacArthur. Helene lives beyond Counselor New Mexico and the Navajo Nation miles and miles from her school uh, at Cuba High, where she has to travel more than an hour in each direction to get to school. She and her mother are members of the Navajo Nation where they live. Her home lacks vital access to utilities, including wired electricity and running water. She relies on a solar panel, a small battery, and a generator for electricity to access broadband, which she receives on her mobile phone, but she cannot use that to complete her schoolwork because her family faces stringent punitive data caps. I'm committed to getting reliable broadband and other basic utilities to Helene and her family. However, tribal governments themselves often lack, lack the resources to construct complete censuses of households without broadband, electricity, and running water. Growing up in the Bay Mills Indian community, you know it is vital that the federal government partner with tribal nations to understand and provide basic utilities to native homes and households. You state that tribal governments rather than federal agencies are best suited to respond to the challenges their communities face. How can the federal government better support tribal nations and households in understanding their basic utility infrastructure needs, including broadband? Thank you, Senator Lujan. And, and first, I appreciate you sharing um, that story, it's, it's all too common across Indian country. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things we need to do are make n needed investments in this area. And President Biden has proposed um, an ambitious infrastructure investment um, across the country, including in Indian country. And, and just last week, uh, Vice President Harris and Secretary Holland, Secretary Raimondo, um, announced the broadband initiative in Indian country. So these are some of the things uh, that can help. Uh, the other thing that we can do uh, with Indian country is, is to be a collaborative trustee by making sure that we are facilitating uh, development of that infrastructure and not being an impediment, which means letting tribes and Indian landowners make those decisions and then getting it done as quickly as we can so they can have access to drinking water, access to broadband, and the things that they need. Uh, yes or no, will you commit to working with me in your role as Assistant Secretary to support tribal governments in creating complete censuses of households on tribal lands and lack 
basic utility infrastructure. Uh, today, IHS, for example, they do comprehensive uh, reviews of lack of water or wastewater, but they count on assessments nation to nation. Uh, I don't believe that they're complete. And in order to make progress to make these investments necessary, I think we need accurate data so that we can make progress together. Is that something you can agree to work with me on? Yes, Senator, we can. Appreciate that. Now, another challenge that I've encountered, several years ago, FEMA issued a declaration after a flood that took out a road and a bridge near Manuelito in the Navajo Nation. I had personally had to go down to moderate a meeting between FEMA, the Navajo Nation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the local county government to try to figure out what was going on to make sure we could expend those funds. Um, the BIA would not secure and grant the right of way necessary to invest the funds that were given uh, and recognized with the natural disaster by FEMA. The bridge is still unpassable. There was poor coordination be between these federal agencies and the BIA still struggles to realize its treaty and trust responsibilities to tribes. If confirmed, what are you going to do to modernize the BIA and its partnerships so it's there to support tribes and protect non-tribal members, especially in situations like the example I provided? Uh, thank you, Senator. And, and I know full well how frustrating that experience is. Um, it, you know, you have everything lined up as a tribe uh, or as a community. Uh, you've done your due diligence with federal agencies. Uh, you're within the bounds of the laws and regulations, and, and for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. Or when federal agencies, you're a spectator as a tribe, and federal agencies have a difficult time connecting. And, and that's something that um, having that experience and frustration, I want to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, one of the ways that we can do that is to make sure that within the Bureau of Indian Affairs on our approval processes, that we're not having, even with the same policies and regulations, that we don't have a patchwork of application depending on which community you're in. Uh, I know that's something that people across Indian country get, just it drives them crazy. <laughs> and um, we're working right now at the Department of the Interior to make sure we've got a consistent application of rights of way regulations, leasing regulations, so that there's not this patchwork and then better coordination across the government. The president has made it clear all of our work, including in Indian affairs, has to be an all of government approach. And um, that communication you're referencing uh, will be done um, through the White House Council in other ways. Chair Schatz, thank you so much. There are a few other questions that I have, but we'll submit them into the record. But especially as we work to secure an infrastructure package, I think these are gonna be areas that we have to address in order to see that infrastructure deployed uh, timely. So thank you for this important hearing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Newland, um, we had a hearing in North Dakota last year. We talked about law enforcement on the reservation and uh, three of the major takeaways were uh, the need to address the shortage of BIA law enforcement officers, particularly in the Great Plains region missing and murdered indigenous women and children, and substance abuse and uh, mental health challenges. So uh, how do you envision working with tribes to address these public safety challenges? I'm sorry, Senator. I, I how do you envision working with the tribes to address these public safety challenges? Uh, again, uh, I think being a collaborative trustee is, is going to be important on that. But we've, uh, when it comes to uh, missing and murdered indigenous persons, and, and I know you've been an advocate and a leader uh, working on these issues, um, um, Senator, part of the big challenge is raising the visibility of it within the federal government and prioritizing it. And Secretary Holland uh, has made this a priority in unmistakably clear terms within the department. Um, and so it, when, when a cabinet secretary says, we're going to focus on missing and murdered indigenous people and violence in Indian country, we're expected to deliver. Uh, we're working to build out the missing and murdered unit within the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, adding staff uh, to that across the country to coordinate on investigations uh, for missing persons and, and murder cases. Um, and I appreciate you highlighting the challenges the Bureau has faced through decades in trying to attract and retain law enforcement staffing across the country. It's, it's been a challenge, as, as you know. Um, it, one of the things that we are starting to do is to go and identify some of the root causes. Is it, is it, 
Is it pay? Uh, is it the challenges of the job? What, it, what is leading to the shortage of officers in many of these communities, including in your state? And I think that's going to be the first step we have to take. Part of it is having training, you know, in the Great Plains region, which is what we set up at the uh, in, at Spirit Lake Reservation, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do have a center now there that is helping with training, because it's very hard to recruit from the uh, Great Plains region if they have to go all the way down for uh, to Artesia to get trained, and uh, and it's hard to get people who are going to Artesia from be it the Southwest or whatever to come up north and in the Great Plains. So part of it is that training center, and I'd ask that you'd be willing to work with me to continue that so we can try to fill these vacancies, which I, as I mentioned, is most acute across the Great Plains region. Senator, I'd be happy to work with you and your team to um, address these issues. Um, Senator Lankford asked about energy, and so I want to follow up on that as well. Uh, the MHA Nation, if they were uh, Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikara, uh, tribes in our state, three affiliated tribes, that reservation, if it were a state, would be in the top 10 oil and gas producing states in the country. They rely on infrastructure to get their oil to market, including Dakota Access Pipeline. And so do you think it's important uh, in the discussion of the Dakota Access Pipeline that, that they have a voice in terms of how that is handled? Thank you for your question, Senator. It, 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 when tribes are impacted by federal decision making, it's, it, it is important that we engage them early on in meaningful consultation. So yes, they should have a voice on matters that directly impact them. If confirmed, would, uh, what's your main goal? What do you think is you can do to help tribes recover from the COVID pandemic? What are some of the key things you think can and should be done? Well, uh, thank you, Senator, for for that question, the opportunity to talk about that. I think one of the big things that we can do uh, coming out of the pandemic is to make sure that tribes have an opportun economic opportunity at home so they can lead safe, fulfilling, and healthy lives um, in their tribal communities. And some of the things, as, as you know from uh, different communities in your state, some of the things that are lacking are just the basic infrastructure that many communities take for granted access to uh, the modern economy through broadband connections. And so making these investments and also making sure that we actually turn those investments into real assets in tribal communities uh, that can benefit people will help tribes weather the storm, whether it's a, a, another pandemic, uh, a natural disaster, um, and that make it so that people have an opportunity to lead those safe, healthy, and fulfilling lives at home. Thank you, and welcome to your family as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, welcome to the nominee, and appreciate your willingness. Um, so I want to bring up several issues. One, I'm I'm excited that the Biden administration is in support of a permanent Cartieri fix. I think this is very important to take land into trust and to have recognized tribes be able to move forward on uh, issues here. It's been very beneficial in the state of Washington over the past several decades when we did have that. If confirmed, can you commit to supporting a clean Cartieri fix and addressing the Department of Interior's policies for taking land into trust? Thank you, Senator. Absolutely. Great. Will you support another initiative that myself, Senator Murkowski, and many others have been supportive of is dealing with the back log and cases related to murdered and indigenous uh, murdered and missing indigenous women um, in Washington State Seattle specifically we have the highest rate of murdered and missing indigenous people um, with cases what if confirmed would you commit to supporting providing resources to helping us tackle this issue uh, thank you senator and I share secretary Holland's commitment to taking meaningful action on uh, addressing the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people across Indian country. Thank you. Um, an agency that affects a lot of our tribes is the Puget Sound Agency Fee to Trust. And the office has had lots of what we'd say serious failings in the processing of realty transactions. Since 2019, the office has had a series of acting superintendents who 
served only four months, the result being a massive backlog of fee to trust applications. As a result, I've heard stories about applications being, uh, be, being in progress literally for years. And so it's failure to really live up to the trust responsibility. As the department considers options, what can you do? What is your plan to help us with this Puget Sound Agency office so we have capacity for the future in dealing with these issues in a timely fashion? Thank you, Senator. I would be happy to uh, take a closer look at the Puget Sound Agency to better understand what's going on there. With, with respect to overall uh, things that we can do, uh, again, part of it is going to involve myself, if confirmed, setting clear expectations within the Bureau of Indian Affairs that this is a priority and that our field staff are expected to make decisions in a timely manner. Nobody should be in Indian country should be in the position that my parents were in, uh, being made to wait years when they had everything they needed to get into a home because the Bureau of Indian Affairs simply would not get to their application. Um, so this is, this is a priority for me, um, making sure that our agencies across the country are consistently applying the laws and the regulations and, and the policies on land into trust and leasing. And uh, I'm, I'm, if confirmed, I'm going to communicate that to our team clearly. Thank you. Another top priority for me is achieving 100% uh, federal medic, medical assistance percentage FMAP for urban Indian organizations, treating them uh, with the same level of parity that you would treat an urban, I'm sorry, a, um, a hospital. 70% of American Indians and Alaska Natives live in urban settings and they rely on urban Indian health. So to me, that should be treated just like any other IHS facility. Um, and so we've been working on this in the past legislation uh, dealing with COVID. And so um, in the Finance Committee, we're also looking at this. So if confirmed, will you commit to supporting efforts to provide urban Indian health organizations 100% of their FMAP funding? Thank you, Senator. Uh, if confirmed, I would look forward to working with uh, folks over at Indian Health Service and, and HHS through the White House Council on Native American Affairs to make sure that uh, we are playing a meaningful and positive role in addressing uh, these challenges across Indian country, including urban Indian health centers. But you, do you see the, a difference between them and a hospital, an IHS hospital? Uh, I'm sorry, Senator? Do you see a difference between, you know... Seattle Indian Health and, and say a hospital in, you know, some other state. I mean, to me, they're they're both facilities run by, you know, Indian health organizations and should be funded with full FMAP funding. Uh, I I don't see the uh, distinction uh, based on, uh, you know, what who's operating a, a health center if they're providing health services. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you. If there are no further questions for our nominee, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ah, excuse me. It I is nice under the radar here, Daines. Mr. Chairman. This thank is you. why we need one day. And we're <laughs> I, to I one couldn't dais. agree more. Thank Senator you. Daines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Greatly appreciated. I'll, I'll be your cleanup hitter here, so I should be done. Uh, Mr. Newland, good to see you again. I really enjoyed our conversation we had a few weeks ago where we discussed the, uh, the Montana Water Rights Protection Act. Uh, the Montana Water Rights Protection Act was approved. Uh, Senator Tester and I worked hard to get that uh, passed last December and signed by the president. Uh, so it's been ratified and confirmed. And uh, it directed the secretary to execute and implement the compact. Despite this very clear directive from Congress, uh, we've yet to see the uh, Secretary of Interior execute the compact. Mr. Newland, can you specifically commit that you and the Department of Interior will do whatever is necessary, including working with the Department of Justice to get the compact signed in the next few weeks. It's been now almost six months. Thank you for that question, Senator, and also for uh, your bipartisan work to get, to get that done and, and to carry the burden here in Congress. Uh, yes, I can commit to working with uh, you and, and others within the Department and Department of Justice to make sure that we're getting that finalized and playing our role. Could we see if we get this done in the next few weeks? I've, uh, Senator, I, I will work to get it done, uh, play a part in getting it done as quickly as we can. Okay. 
I, I know the the tribe uh, very much wants to see this was uh, years in the uh, in negotiations and it settles a century old um, water dispute as you know but thank you for that commitment um, CSKT and also the Blackfeet water rights settlements along with several other authorized settlements across the West they still require significant funding to meet the federal obligations guaranteed by the terms of the settlements. And the longer it takes to fully fund these settlements, the greater the cost to the American taxpayer and the long important treaty and trust obligations continue to be frankly ignored. As Congress works on the appropriations process, we look to provide funding for these Indian water rights settlements. My question, Mr. Newland, is how can you ensure that the department and the administration's plan appropriately for budgeting discretionary funding, that they plan appropriately for that within the DOI's budget to meet these very important obligations. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, but I, di I didn't understand or missed Yeah, so it's how can you ensure that the department and the administration that they plan appropriately for budgeting these discretionary funding items within the, the department's budget, the DOI's budget, so we can meet these obligations Thank you, Senator. I know that the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs uh, works closely with the Secretary's Indian Water Rights Office, which uh, kind of coordinates this work for the Department of the Interior. And uh, we have made it a priority to make sure that we are completing our obligations uh, under enacted Indian Water Rights Settlements. Um, I believe uh, there, there may be items in uh, the President's budget request related to uh, these two settlements. Um, and we'll be happy to work with you and your team to make sure we're getting that done. Thank you. Uh, my last question, uh, last Congress, uh, I raised an issue that the Department of the Interior was slow rolling the improvements for land records required to implement the Hearth Act, which poses significant challenges for our tribes. In October of 2019, we were told that external portals as a proxy for the trust asset and accounting management system would only be, I was told, weeks away. That was back in October of 19. I realize that was before your time. Uh, it's been almost two years since we were promised we were weeks away, and these portals have never materialized. Um, Mr. Newland, could you commit to digitizing Fort Belknap's and other tribes' land records and getting these portals up and running in accordance with the funding that's been appropriated. Thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate you highlighting that issue. Um, full implementation of the Hearth Act is something that's, as we spoke about, is near and dear to my heart. Um, when it comes to uh, those portals, uh, we, uh, I believe, uh, have made that accessible to some of the compacted and contracted tribes. Um, and. Uh, I believe we can work with you and, and your team to provide a demonstration of that work. Um, and when it comes to Fort Belknap, um, I would be happy to uh, work with the tribe there and make sure that, that they have uh, clear and accurate land records and, and the things that they need to manage their lands effectively. Mr. Newland, thank you. You have my support in your nomination. And I look forward to working with you um, to help out Indian country, not only in Montana, but uh, uh, around the country. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. On that positive note, if there are no more questions, uh, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. I would ask members to do so promptly as we'd like to um, uh, move this confirmation as expeditiously as possible. I'd also ask the nominee to respond fully and as promptly as possible to any follow-up questions we may have and also to meet with any remaining committee members who may wish to do so. The hearing record will be open for one week. Thank you, Mr. Newland, and thank you to your family. Uh, you must be very proud um, for your time and your testimony and all of your collective public service. Uh, it is much appreciated. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.